Uh, Ephesians chapter number 2, look with me if you will at verse number 5. We're going we're to read verse 5 through 7 now. Last week we looked at but God, and this week we're going to look at the issue of our heavenly conversation. And we'll see why I said that. That's not a verse actually from Philippians 3. But watch what Paul says, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 5. Paul, well, let's start at verse 4. But God who is rich in mercy, for his, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, have quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, again we come to you to give you thanks and praise for your wonderful word. As we look into the word, uh, of, of, of grace. And here in the book of Ephesians by our Apostle Paul, may you give us great insight and understanding and wisdom. May our hearts uh, submit to the understanding that you give us through your spirit and through your word. And may, may it bring forth the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ. We thank you for this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Alright, last time we saw but God. And we said that that terminology in verse 4, but God, <laughs> if you just took those first two words all through scripture, uh, you could do a whole series of studies just on but God. Mm-hmm. And even in Paul's epistles, that but God. Because something is one way, we were children of wrath, even as others, verse 3, but God. God stepped into human history through the Lord Jesus Christ. When Jesus of Nazareth lived on this planet Earth, that was God manifest in the flesh. Now, God had obviously been involved in human history throughout time past. But in no time did he ever become human flesh, incarnate. When God did that, he now began a process of reclaiming and reconciling what we now know through Paul's both the heavens and the earth back into himself. The thing he created Adam, the first Adam to do, to reconcile the earth to himself, that, that Adam failed. He created the last Adam, the second man, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he pleased the Father. He succeeded. And he wrought the Father's will. He then died for the sins of mankind. Now we know. And the sins of Israel time passed. Now through Paul, the sins of all men. And through the Apostle Paul, through Christ coming back, rode to Damascus, saving the Apostle Paul, giving him a message of Gentile grace and so forth. Now that's what he's been doing the last couple thousand years. One day, very soon, Mary and I have to come, Lord. We're going to be ending, he's going to end the dispensation of grace. We're going to be with our, our Lord. The judgment seat of Christ, which is the, should be your focus now in this world, the judgment seat of Christ. The Lord is at hand, he says in Philippians. And what that means, the righteous judge is at hand, so we need to live like it. And then he's going to have the judgment seat of Christ determine how we've used and, and, and abided in this flesh, how we have used the time, redeemed the time, building up the, the mystery of Christ, the grace of God in us. And then he's going to hand us over to the Father who's going to determine where we're going to be for all eternity. Okay? Now, what Ephesians focuses on is God's kindness and rich mercy toward us. Look at verse 4. But God who is rich in mercy for his what? Great love wherewith he loved us. If you didn't see our last week's session about the, the issue of having a, a, uh, a, what was it? I forgot what I said last week. Ah, it's on there. I got it. A secure love. That's right. A secure love. Everybody needs a secure love, right? And there is a secure love we saw, but God commended his love toward us. Romans 5 verse 8. And then while we get sinners, Christ died for us. Secure love. Then it's a significant purpose. Now that you're saved and you know you're, you're, you're saved, what's your purpose in life? Our purpose in life is what the Apostle Paul's purpose in life. Getting the grace of God in us and, and through us to others. That's the work of faith, the labor of love. And then as we suffer and endure, the patience of hope, and we get that hope of glory. That's it's our hope of glory. We get our reward out there. So there's a significant purpose. You can, you can live life every day. By the way, I see it, I, I lived it when I play baseball and such, and you can see it in the world. People don't know why they were born, why they were here, why are we here? Well, if you're in Christ, you have a significant purpose. You know you're here to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ through the mystery of Christ. And then that last thing is a strong hope. As you endure these sufferings of this present time, Chris and I, as we were listening to this, we don't listen to politics, we don't care about it, but when we just listen to the show... We were saying how all the politicians lying about this and that just to get elected. They've been doing it 
forever. It's like if, if, if your only hope was in this world and in the politics of this world, whether you're on the right or left, or whatever, how, how, how sad that is for your existence. Because your guy lies too to get elected. And their guy lies. It's, it's all a farce anyway. It's the God of this world behind it. So we need a more strong hope, a stronger hope. And that has to do with our heavenly conversation. Today, go with me, if you will, to Philippians, go to Philippians 3. And when I say that heavenly uh, conversation, that's what the Apostle Paul says. That's the topic of our message. Or the title. I don't do topical message, I do titles, so that people can know where we're at. Um, look at Philippians chapter 3 and verse number 20. We'll just jump right into context. Philippians 3.20, for our conversation is where? In heaven. Now that issue of conversation and so forth, let me get my, uh, where my paper? Oh, there it is. That issue of conversation, that has to do with your conduct, your behavior. Uh, it's that word back and forth. When you converse with somebody, you go back and forth. Literally means who you associate with. And when Paul says our conversation is in heaven, that's where we're to focus on. In Colossians, he says, set your what? Affection on things above. What Christ says on the right, right hand of God. So notice in verse 20 of Philippians 3. For our conversation is in heaven, from it's also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's our Savior. Listen, this world is a mess. Let me put this in here. This world is a mess. And no politician is going to save us from ourselves or themselves, okay? The only rescue, the only deliverance is the Lord Jesus Christ coming back, right? And taking us home. This world is not going to get any better. It's only going to get what? Worse. Worse. It is on a collision course with the wrath of Almighty God. It's not getting better. Politics, that's not going to make it better. The only thing that's going to make it better is the day that the Lord Jesus Christ comes and actually sits bodily presence on this earth in the future. But that's between now and then, it's just going to get worse. But not for us. Pretty soon, he's going to come and deliver us from the wrath to come. That's why he says, verse 20, For our conversation is in heaven, from which also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. By the way, you see that word conversation? Citizenship. That citizenship, it's, it's, it's our word, polit- our politics. It's political. Something that's similar to policies or political. So the politics of the grace believer is not down here. That's that's what's behind that word conversation. It, it, it's, it's, I can't say the word. It's, it's, it's almost the word politics or political. And what it means is politics, the policies of this earth, is not what we focus on. It's the policies up there, okay? All right, go back to Ephesians chapter number 2. So again, God gives us in verse 4 his great love and sent the Christ to die for us. We have that, uh, that, 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 that secure love, significant purpose, and strong hope. Look at verse number 5. Here's how great that love is. Verse 5. Even when we were what? Dead in sins. You know, Ryan and I were talking, we, we talked about things, particularly after everyone leaves. We're talking about being dead in sins. The issue, when, when you're not saved, when you're lost, before Almighty God, you are dead in sins. Now remember that. Paul says we were dead in trespasses and sins, right? But now he says we're dead in sin. We already went through that issue of trespasses. That's a particular type uh, of robbing God of his glory. But here, we were dead in sins. We were born that way. We were born by nature, children of wrath and children of disobedience. We're dead in sins. A dead man can't do anything. That's why you, you can't, that's why you're saved by grace. There's nothing that you can do in order to be right with God in your own strength. Because you're dead. The only thing a dead person can do is sit there until God gives them life, right? There it is. So not, watch what he says. Even when we were dead in sin. Remember we saw in Romans 5 verse 8, But God commended His love. He demonstrated and proved His love in a tangible way. And that while we were yet what? Sinners. Christ died for us. He didn't say stop sinning. Can a sinner stop sinning? No. No, because you're dead in sins. You, 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 you're, fortunately, you can't get out of that situation. You need somebody to give you life, and only Jesus Christ can give you that. Is that speaking of the Spirit? It's speaking of God. No, I mean, the Godhead. The dead in 
Our spirit is dead. Oh, spirit. Oh, yes. We went over that. Yes. Uh, sorry, I'm sorry about that. I thought you meant who quickened you. No. When it says you're dead in sins, yes, Dorothy, spiritually dead. When I say spiritually dead, your spirit is separated from the life of God. Right. I mean, you're, you know, they're alive. Lots of people are alive physically. But right. when it comes, we went over all those deaths, right? This one is the one where your spirit is separated from the life of God. Exactly. Spiritually. Okay. Now, then there's another, there's the, the second death, or a one where you're spiritually dead, separated from God for eternity. That happens after you die physically, but this is the one, exactly. So it's spiritually dead, verse 5. Even when we were dead in sins, here's what Christ, this, by the way, when we, the we there, is the believer, the member of the body, hath quickened us, because the ones who he quickened together with who? Christ. In the body. Yeah. That's our spiritual baptism of Romans 6 and 1 Corinthians chapter number 12, verse 13. For by one spirit are we all what? Baptized into one body. Romans 6 says we were buried, uh, we, did, we crucified with him, buried with him, and raised together with him. So spiritual baptism, not water, spiritual, okay? All right. By the way, later in Ephesians 4, verse 5, Paul says there's one baptism. One. It is not water. It's the spiritual baptism. Okay. So, here we go. Verse 5. When we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. Now watch what Paul says parenthetically. By grace you're saved. Now what do we say grace was? Grace is unmerited favor. Unmerited. Means you can't do anything to gain this favor. No, not merited. And, and undeserved kindness. You don't deserve it. We don't deserve it. If God dealt with us on what we deserve, we all deserve hell and lake of fire. Because we sin. That we be consumed. That's right. It's his, it's his grace. Watch this. For, and he talks about unmerited favor, undeserved kindness, right? And the great thing is God's riches at Christ's expense. God's riches at Christ's expense. All right, let's keep going. By grace you are saved. And, now he goes back to our spiritual... Uh, baptism of Romans 6, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. He says, And hath raised us up together. That's together with Christ. And made us sit together where? In heavenly places. The gentleman who called from Somerset, he says, I saw Brother Ron, I see these other guys with this truck. Man, where can I get one of these trucks? So I called him back, I said, I can tell you where to get the big one. I said, we got some small ones. He said, send me some of the small ones. <laughs> he says, I like the way that thing folds off and shows the different things of the grace and all that. Okay? Although he's an elderly gentleman, he, he's, he's been rightly divided, learning to rightly divide the word for three years. Okay? And uh, so he just found out. He says, man, I searched for, uh, far and wide for people here in California. But I said, we're here now. He said, we came here a couple of years ago. So anyway, I'm going to send him the chart. But in this chart, someone asks his brother Ron, what's that up there? It says the main sphere, the main sphere of influence, we have an influence down here now, but the main sphere of influence, let's say it's a couple thousand years of the body here, from Paul to the rapture, but for all eternity, the main sphere of influence for the body of Christ is where? The heavenly places. Now, we already did studies on that in our past Ephesians studies. Brian has already, or we'll post them. By the time you see this, it's posted. All right, let's go to verse number six again. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places. Where? In Christ Jesus. And see, just the fact that we're in Christ and God has promised the Lord Jesus Christ, although he's going to sit bodily here, in his flesh here, for he's with Israel, according to prophecy, the way that God is going to allow Jesus Christ to, how do I want to say, inhabit the heavenly places, is through the body of Christ. We are literally His body. And that's what the event of the rapture, the resurrection, the catching away, we're going to be called to the judgment seat of Christ. By the way, the judgment seat of Christ should be on our mind. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. What motivated the Apostle Paul was the judgment seat of Christ. He wanted to give his full reward. He tells the Galatians, have you suffered so many things in vain, if it be yet in vain? You can go along and along and along, even with the Apostle Paul and the doctrine of grace and the mystery, and suffer for it, okay? Suffer in, that's the way Christ suffers in, in the truth. 
And then at the end, like Demas, it will be, have you suffered so many things in vain, empty useless, if it be yet in vain. Paul wrote Galatians to kind of get them back. He was giving them a last ditch effort to come on and come back to the truth. Did it with the Corinthians as well. So our job as grace preachers is to always keep ourselves and those that hear us keep going in the truth. Because you don't want to suffer, you don't want to be where you're at now and then get there and Christ says, hey, because you fell away at the end before the rapture, before your death, it's all in vain. And it'll be in vain. It's all or nothing. What did he say to these people? He says, he says that guy who puts his hand to the plow and goes and turns back is not worthy. Same principle. Once you're in it, you're in it. In it to win it, right? That's what I mean. Well, you're in it to win it. You'll win the prize, Philippians 3. You've gone so far now, why fall off? It's ridiculous. Like Daniel said, hey, stay with it now. Don't let it be in vain if it be yet in vain. You keep going in the judgment of Christ. All right, here we go. Why did God do what he did? Look at verse 7. Why did he raise us? By the way, why did he put us in heaven? Because here we go. That in the what? Ages to come. He might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. We could spend a whole series of messages just on that one verse. We're not. But we could. Look at that. Perfect. That in the ages to come. I was thinking about this ages to come. That word ages. You ever heard the word eons? Eons? That's the Greek word behind it. It means it, it has a beginning and an end. Let me show you something about how, how God created things. You know, Leonard's one of his favorite verses from Ecclesiastes. There's nothing new under the sun. What has been will be. So God has, he, he has cycles all through scripture. You see, see time are okay. But also, there's linear time. So what it is, when God, time flow, it, it, go, it goes forward. God created to go forward to, to, throughout eternity. But within this linear time, so God's actually on a time scale forward, but then there's these linear cycles, right? That's right. Cycles. So stuff happens, it's seasons and cycles. And inside so, of that, and, it, it, even side of that, pattern. Yeah, exactly. God, it's, it's all through there. And you can see all these things, but time still goes forward, but there's cycles, okay? What he's saying is, once we get out to the heaven, now I, I don't understand it fully yet. I say, Lord, I want to, maybe it'll take me another 10 or 20 years. But he's saying that even out there, even in eternity future, because the word eons or ages means it has a beginning, okay, and an end. And then something else happens. Well, that's how eternity is. It's not just... It is, it is straight. Eternity is a straight line. Eternity. Uh, it doesn't end. It's forever e eternal. But in, within eternity, there are these ages. Greek word eons, okay? They have a beginning, distinct beginning, distinct end. And this happens all the way through. I don't understand it, but that's what God says. Let's look at it. That in the ages to come... So, even throughout eternity, these linear cycles, Paul uses terms like time past, but now ages to come. By the way, I have, you, you guys don't even know, I like to share these with you. People call me or email and say, hey, something you said clicked for me. One guy says, very faithful brother in the Lord back in Minnesota, he goes, I got it when you talked about time past, but now ages to come. I got it when you talked about past, present, future. He says, seeing, oh, past, God did some things in the past with Israel. In the present with the body of Christ, and then again in the future with Israel. He says, I got it. That that past, present, future. Our lives are like that. Your past, your present, and your future, right? He says, I got it when you talk about that. Well, that's how it is. God will talk about time past. It, it was this way. Ephesians 2, we're going to see Paul says that in time past you Gentiles in the flesh. But now, in the dispensation of grace, God's doing this. And in the ages to come, he's going to do that. Let's look what he's going to do with us. Verse 7. That in the ages to come, he might show. <laughs> that, that King James word, show, S-H-E. I've heard people use it. I've heard recordings of King James. Sometimes I listen to it on recording in Carson, uh, the, the, on audio. And they'll say, shoo, it just make me laugh. <laughs> 
Or I heard a guy teaching one day, and he said, shoe. And I'm like, you think shoe? That's just the old English word for show. Study to show thyself approved unto God. 2 Timothy 2, 15, it actually mm-hmm. says study to shoe. But you understand, that means to show. God's going to put on display something, verse 7, that in the ages to come, he might what? Show. By the way, it's not about us, really. What is he going to put on display? The exceeding riches of his what? Grace. Can I tell you the one word that I would use? If somebody says, you have one word, you know, go on some teacher, Pastor Ron, you've been teaching God's word, don't you? You've been studying the Bible. Give me one word to describe the God of the Bible. I'll say, gracious. Amen. Gracious. Amen. Because you could say, he's holy and just. All those things are true, but what he is, the thing that trumps him, allows him to be who he is, is he's gracious, he's rich. And what Jesus Christ is, look, God loved mankind so much. Look at mankind. He loved his whole creation so much. There's other beings out there, the angels and so who are under bondage. The whole creation is under that bondage of corruption because of Satan. He loved it so much. He said, you know what? I gotta fix this. I gotta fix it. I gotta fix it. God didn't even trust, I mean, he, he, tr- look, he tried with a man, Adam. Brother uh, Matt in Southern Cal, we, we talk about two, three hours every Sunday night. He means that is good for us, for me too. I love it. I don't even talk on the phone. I have to talk to do it for him. I, I, and he needs that. And he was asking, he says, the Lord Jesus Christ, he was tempted. He was tempted in all points as we are yet without sin. He said, but he wasn't born with a sin nature. I said, yes. He said, so how can he be tempted with sin? You know, we sin. So I said, well, it's like this. There are certain sins that all of us are, are uh, kind of prone to, right? And maybe others that we're not. Before, my whole life, so if I see some money there, <laughs> except when I was a little boy, my mother said, back in the day before debit cards, we'd go off through Aldi's or something or whatever, and I'd pick, I'm, I'd pick up the money. I'm so honored, I'd pick it up. what I do, mother? I'd say, you only not remember to do I'd go, anybody lose $5? And she'd go, shh, shh, shh. Because I, I, I see the money and I have to be in a store. I know it ain't mine. I say, anybody, by the way, debit cards and credit, you, you don't have a lot of cash anymore. But I pick it up and say, anybody uh, lose $5? Everybody. Everybody come running. That was me, shorty. Yeah, thanks, man. Right. Nice. So I, I learned quickly, just pick it up and put it in. And I walk like this anyway, looking down. I used to find all type of cash walking on the ground back in the day before debit cards. I'm sad that we don't have, we're a cashless society now. But if I see money, it, 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 it really, um, I have sin, but it doesn't tempt me at all. <coughs> you can, sure, fine. But other, but other people, man, they're, they're thieves or they're, they're cut those or whatever, you know, thieves. That's a temptation. Well, Jesus Christ was like that with everything. Even though he had human flesh, nothing, nothing could make him disobey his father's word. So what I explained to him, I said, you see, he's called the last Adam, right? Therefore, there was the first Adam. Was the, did the first Adam have a sin nature? No. No. There's your key. The first Adam did not have a sin nature. Eve did not have a sin nature. So there were other beings on planet Earth, the first, who never had a sin nature, yet they still what? Sin. So let me tell you, the first Adam did not have a sin nature, was tempted. By the way, by the way, we're gonna, you're gonna, I'm going to teach you what? By grace through faith. He was tempted by Satan through who? Eve. There you go. The means and the vessel. And I, that's, 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 I'm going to show you that to show you how by grace and faith. So Adam was tempted by, Satan couldn't just come to Adam himself. Because Adam was not deceived. But Satan watched them, knew that she was the weaker vessel, knew he could get her to fall, and that Adam's love for her would make him be able to be seduced by her into falling. So Satan is wise. He says, I can't go to him. Let me go to her, watching them. And so Adam, although he had no sin nature, Eve, although she had no sin nature, both were tempted by the devil. Eve's the weaker vessel, Peter. Peter says, first, two, three. She was perfect, ladies. She was sinless, ladies. But she was easily deceived by the serpent. Beguiled. Beguiled. That's it. Paul uses that in 2 Corinthians 11. Beguiled. Serpent beguiled Eve. And then, at the same time, Satan and his wicked wisdom knew that once he got her, he could then make her get her husband to eat of the fruit too. Adam was in the seed. So look, Adam had no sin nature, yet he was tempted. 
by the devil through his wife, and he fell. The Lord Jesus Christ was tempted by the devil. He didn't have a wife. He was tempted directly. He did not fail. He what? Succeeded. Satan could not get the Lord Jesus Christ to go against the word of God to him, like he got Adam to go against the word of God to him and eat up the fruit. So can you have no sin nature and be tempted and, 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 make, and fall? Yes. Adam and Eve did it. The Lord didn't. Okay? Now, watch this. It says, so his exceeding riches, verse 7, what God wants to put on display, and he did it because he himself came down and lived as a man, both the Lord Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, he then died for mankind's sin on the cross, shed his blood, and anyone today who places their faith alone in Christ shed blood alone at Calvary receives all forgiveness of, forgiveness of all sin. Then what God does, but wait, there's more. Like the guy says in commercial. He just didn't deliver you from hell and lake of fire. He takes us and re- that's what Paul is, Paul is talking about this in verse 5 and he says, hey, watch this, look at verse 5. Even when we were dead in sins, he takes us from the laws of the law and did what? Had quickened us together with Christ by grace you're saved. But not just that, but has what? Raised us up together. Look how far God has taken us from the lowest low to the highest heights. Raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places. Where? In who? In who? Christ Jesus. Here's the purpose. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his love. So we haven't even begun to see this. Oh, just, just scratching the surface. Just, just scratching the surface. The tip of the iceberg, Dorothy. Let me tell you something. Watch this, watch this. God had to come and do for him, for man what man could not do. So God did it. And what Jesus on the cross accomplished for the Father is this. By dying for us, he allowed God to be who he is, just gracious. Sin was always hindering God from being who he really wanted to be. Yeah. He, he, was, he says to Israel, I don't want to be this God just destroying you and destroying the people. I want to be gracious to people. But, but sin was a barrier, and so the Lord Jesus had to come and get that barrier called sin. He, Paul's going to say he, he took it out of the way and nailed him into his cross. Look at this. Um, go to Colossians. Go to Colossians chapter number 2. What Christ did, he took out of the way the barrier for God being himself, the gracious God he is. Look at Colossians chapter number 2. Yes, yes. Let's look at, well, that's right, let's start at verse 13. Thank you, Andrew. Right in uh, Colossians 2 13. And you being dead, oh, oh, by the way, this is the actual passage that goes with what we were just looking at. So here go. And you, so again, those members of the body, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you some of your trespasses. Oh, that's right. Blotting out the handwriting, handwriting of ordinances, which was what? Against us. And which was contrary to us. And took it what? Out of the way, how? Nailing it to his cross. See, now God has made a way so that sin is not a barrier for him to be gracious. And, and, and when he culminates this dispensation of grace and he puts us out there on display for all the world to see, for all the creation to see, because it's not going to just be in the heavens that this is... Remember, Jesus Christ down here, the earth will see us. Just the same way you go out at night on a clear side and you can see stars from miles. You can even get a telescope and see it. Well, there's not going to be this division, this, this barrier, this, this firmament to keep the heavens separated from the earth. Mankind will be able to look up and see us and rejoice and say, I see you, Jim. I see you up there shining brightly, just like you see stars. That's what Paul says, first verse 15. And that's going to be to the glory of God. Go back to go back to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 7 again. See, God's going to do something to bear his glory. And he has chosen little people like you and me. Members of the body, but can I tell you something? It's even greater than that. Those of us who desire...
to walk in the steps of the Apostle Paul who loved this mystery, the joint heirs of Christ, those who get the reward of the inheritance. Let me tell you something. We're going to reign with him and all that. Those are going to be the brightest of the bright. And he's going to say, you guys didn't deserve it, but you believe my word through Paul. And look, this is a good thing. And from ages to come. Let me tell you something about the ages to come. I didn't even put that on there. It's in these little cycles. And like Leonard said, what did you say about those right there, Leonard? Yes, patterns. Pa- patterns and cycles. You know what's in there? There's things happening. There's some happenings. There's some, some things are happening. <clears throat> Different things are happening. People say, oh, heaven's going to be boring. Mm-hmm. I throw this out. That's where you matter. Don't you ever say that heaven's going to be Are you yes. boring in the presence of Almighty God? That's where you learn to master the craft. Master your craft. And like Dorothy said, we have not even scratched the surface, the tip of the iceberg of what's going to go on. We, we, Paul can't even describe it fully. When we get there, every age will be greater and greater and greater and greater and greater and greater. And greater. You know how I know that? Every year that I would Christian. I got some people who I drive around at my, at my <clears throat> secular job at the, at the, at the uh, home there, the senior home, who have been married 70 years. And you say, what in the world? Well, that guy, they knew each other 70 years ago, but each year of their life, this way, they learn more and more about each other. That's what's going to happen with the Father in His presence for all eternity. We're going to be, by the way, in those 70 years of their marriage, they've been doing things. You know what? They had a honeymoon back here. They were they didn't have children. All of a sudden, they had children. Now they got thirteen grandchildren, and now some of them got great grandchildren. Like life happens. People have come and gone, and blah blah blah. The only thing won't happen to us. People won't die and come and go. We'll just meet. See, life happens, and God's all these cycles. Of, I mean, we talk about cycles of life, right? You talk to seniors, ninety years old. There's cycles of life. There, some many of the men were in World War Two. And many of the widows, husbands were in World War II. Told you about the woman who rode with me. Her husband was stationed in Los Angeles, 1941, about a Los Angeles. He called her. She told me he called her. They said, "Hey, he was a he was a pilot for the Air Force." Said we I was, we were shooting at something that didn't come down. Our arsenals, our shots were bouncing off this thing. We were going over bone. He goes, <clears throat> they're going to say that it's a, a, a balloon, a weather balloon. It wasn't, because I was out there. By Los Angeles. It was, a, it, was a, it was a craft, an unidentified craft, that they still, this day, saying as a, she, was, she laughed, laughed, like she said, oh no, my husband was there. When he got home, he couldn't wait to tell me about it. He said, she got a bomb and stink. He said, they were on alert because they thought the Japanese, this is on the coast, this is on the Pacific coast of Los Angeles, they thought the Japanese were coming. They could see this thing coming. They were the Japanese. They got all their forces with it. It wasn't the Japanese. <laughs> More like <laughs> something else. Like metal. Okay? So stuff happened. I got that second hand. Her husband was out there. Okay? All right. So all of these things going to take place. Verse 7. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us. God has put his kindness upon the believer in Christ. See, Ephesians shows God's devotion to us. Now, when we study Colossians or look at verse from Colossians, remember what I said? <clears throat> the focus of Colossians, so in Ephesians, it's the focus God's devotion to us. So his, his devotion toward us. See, see, notice how he says that. That in the ages to come, verse 7, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness where? Toward us through Christ. So there's Ephesians. Colossians, it's our devotion to Him. That's why Paul talks about the reward of the inheritance as a joint heir. He talks about the thrones and so forth. Things he does not mention in Ephesians. Okay? Alright. So God now, through the cross of Christ, is, is able to just be Himself. What, you know what it is to just relax and just be yourself? Sometimes. Sometimes. <laughs> Let me tell you, Chris and I, we were very blessed. To have a spouse who loves the Lord, loves the mystery, have the same heart. We're, we're basically a male-female version of each other, same age. It just, it's just so weird, compatible, chemistry. But you know the best thing about it? I can be myself with her and she can be herself. She told me in the past, because she's so introverted and stuff, similar to Chris now, people try to get, oh, come out your shell, come on, be... Be, don't be so shy, my boy. She's like, I, something wrong with me. No. 
She who she is. She was born that way. That's just who she is. Right. And I'm who I am. But to have somebody who not only allows you to be yourself, but appreciate the self you are, that's fantastic. What God has done through the cross, he can now just be himself. And he has some people in us, us race believers, who say, Lord, just be yourself. Tell me who you are through Paul. I want to know your mind. I want to know you. And God says, yeah, I want you to know me. And you're going to know me so much that I'm going to reward that, that, that effort of getting to know me down here. And then all you guys are going to get to know your father for the rest of all eternity. You're going to be the help me he designed. The help me he designed. That's what he created Adam to be. Be the help me. See, Eve was Adam's help, meet and fit and proper for him. But Adam was to be God's help, meet and fit and proper for his regent. His right hand man. Right. And we're going to be his right hand man. The one new man, the body of Christ. Shall by his orders that he gave him. That's right. The, 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 the charge he gave him. So look at verse number 8. Further explanation about all of this. For by grace, unmerited favor, undeserved kindness, God riches at Christ's expense. For by grace are ye saved, what? Through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, which any man should boast. Let me get this out there. I get all types of questions. A lot of things I, I do, you think I'm nuts to expound on it. Not you guys, but people. But understand, I get so many Bible questions, so as I'm reading a verse, things come up, people ask me. That's what I was teaching on how to give. On our Roman studies, you don't have to go back to the tithes and offerings and all that to motivate people. If you do it the way Paul says, it'll motivate them even more. 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 One of the things that get confused about this with uh, the doctrine of Calvinism is that you'll hear them say that in that Ephesians 2, 8, 9... 2, 8, and 9, that the gift of God, gift of God, they'll say it's the faith. And, and when they say faith, they mean you're so dead, you can't even believe. The faith, I'll say it like this, the issue of free, you don't have free will. Well, that's just goofy. Just, you get a, Bible, a King James Bible concordance and just type in free will. It's used multiple times. There are things that God says he, he doesn't even know. In Jeremiah, he says, you guys out there offering your children to these idols, burning them to the flame. He says, it didn't even enter into my mind to do that. See, man has free will. So they'll say the gift of God is faith. But really what the gift of God is, it's the salvation. Yes, it's, it's, it's Romans 6.23. How about that? Just let Paul describe. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is what? Eternal life. Now, God does, there's, there's an essence of, 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 uh, of faith that God has for the humanity. It's called the faith of Christ. But let me tell you, your individual will, your individual faith, who you are, you must hear the word of God and believe it. After that, you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, that Gentile salvation, in whom also after that you believed. So every human being must exercise faith. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by how? The word of God, right? It's the only way to please God. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Hebrews 11, 6. So now, they're right in this way. Faith does come from God. But that's not what this verse is. The way it comes from God is through his word. God first give you his word, right? You can't have faith without the, what to, to have faith in. Faith back here in the Old Testament is different than faith. Back, in the Old Testament, faith is do a work yeah. in prophecy. In the dispensation of grace, faith is don't do a work to be saved. Okay? So, yes, God gives you the word. And then you, so here's God's part. Here's God. He sends his word of the gospel of grace through Paul, through a minister like myself, through you guys, whoever, through the word of the Bible. And then God has chosen, like Leonard says, has man as his region. So man, so God does his part, and now man has to believe. The moment you exercise faith and believe, God saves you. That's right, saves you. Romans 4, 5. But to him that worketh not, but believe, believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, 
Here's what. Faith is counted for righteousness. So the gift of God there is not the faith. It's the salvation. Let's look at it. In this verse. Verse 8. For by grace are ye saved through faith. And not of yourself. So the subject is the issue of saved. How can I get saved? Can I get saved of myself? No. No. I get saved by grace, God's grace, through, through faith. Okay? Again, like, okay, let's just keep going. I'll show you. For by grace are you saved, verse 8, through faith. And that not of yourselves. I mean, right there it tells you, not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. So he's talking about the salvation. It is the gift of God. Not of works. Let's say man should boast. You would say, look, look what I did. <clears throat> now, remember what I said. When he talks about, Paul uses all types of terminology in con- different contexts. He'll talk about by grace. He'll say, therefore being justified by faith. Romans 5, that's your saving faith in Christ. We walk by faith. There's our second by faith. Uh, that's the sanctification. One's a justification. Same thing. This one here is by God's grace through faith. Now, it starts with the faith of Jesus Christ. He's the power source. This is why God can do it, okay? But the faith here is you exercise, you're exercising your faith. Now, watch this. By grace. Here's the means. Through faith. There's the instrumentality, or the, the instrument. Okay? I'm going to show you something more. Let me use Adam and Eve. Here's Satan. Here's the serpent. He wants to get Adam to fall. He doesn't go directly to Adam. He knows he can't get him to fall directly. So what does the serpent do? Instead of going directly to Adam, he goes to his weaker vessel. Why? So serpent goes to Eve, and through Eve, that's his plan to get Adam. So who did God blame the, the, the entire thing on? It's the serpent. So here's the means. So it was the serpent who did it by way of Eve. So he did it by Eve. Oh, no, wait, sorry. It was the serpent through Eve. Right, through Eve. Okay, she was the vessel. That's my point. So anyway, the, Satan was behind the temptation, and he did it through Eve. By grace, that's the means, because of what he accomplished on Calvary, through exercising saving faith, Okay. So look, he says, verse 8, For by grace are ye, as the body of Christ, the believer, saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. That salvation is the gift of God. Come on. Then in case you don't know what he's saying, not of what? Works, lest any man should boast. Over in Romans eleven six, he says, And if it be by grace, then it is no more of works, otherwise... Grace is no more grace. And if it be of works, then it's no more by grace, otherwise work is no more work. Works and grace and, and for salvation, those things are like oil and water. They don't mix, okay? Today, today, in the presentation of grace. You, uh, go, go ahead, Lenny. When you had that up there, I hate you erase it. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. But you know, uh, I found it real easy. My dad and his mother, my grandmother, they had an old country saying, mm-hmm. uh, say for instance, my grandmother tell me, I want you to wash the dishes and have them done by the time I get home. Okay. Well, if I didn't wash the dishes, that's what she would do. What would she do? She would say one of the most precarious things. she said, you didn't hear me. Okay. Uh, what? I heard you. Yeah. No, you didn't hear me. She said, if you heard me, the dishes would be done. All right. Adam right. didn't hear God. That's right. He didn't hear. He didn't have ears to hear. Let him hear. He, really he didn't hear God. If he had heard God, he would have responded That's appropriately right. to, to Eve's begotten. Exactly. And I'm sorry for those who are... It should, it should have picked it should, it might, it should pick up this close to my I just want to make sure everybody could hear it. But that's a great... Exactly. To hear, if Adam would have truly heard the Lord, he would not have... Sin against the, the Lord. That's right. Notice in verse number um, 10, further explanation of what God's doing. For we are, whose workmanship? His workmanship. Uh, 
I don't go into the Greek a lot. I know a lot of this stuff, but really I do it so you can enhance the King James Bible, enhance it. Sometimes people do it kind of but it's a beautiful word behind workmanship. It's our word poem. It's a poema. A poem. Think about a poem. There takes some thought. It takes some some putting together, some rhyme and what'd you say? Rhythm. Some rhythm. That's right. Rhyme and rhythm. So what he's doing as he's building the body of Christ, that's what I'm saying. It's, it's all, it says in 1 Corinthians, he tempered the body as it had pleased him. Oh. We're, we're, you got something to share, share, share with us, man. That word that you just mentioned, uh-huh. uh, workmanship, Yes, it's also akin to the word symphony. Symphony, symphony. yes, a symphony, yes. Yeah. That's what you said, yeah. It work. It's all those things. It, there was some thought, there was some design into it. Paul talks about a workman who, that he does not be ashamed. God's a workman. He desires for us to be workmen in his truth. The rightly divided word. Verse 10, for we are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus unto what? Good works. When we talk about the sanctified works of a grace believer, the body of Christ was created for good works. Okay? You know, sometimes we'll get accused of, which is weird, we'll get accused of legalism because we're trying to uh, motivate saints to do the good works of the sanctified grace believer in, in the mystery. The work of faith, building up the word of God in you, the labor of love or charity or the love of God, that's taking it and getting it out through you to others and through ministry and so forth. The good works, the whole entire book of Titus, and Titus was a worker, it's three chapters. I, it just blows me away. I mean, who don't know that? Well, some people don't have to work grace. Three chapters all about what? Good works. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Look at the rest of that verse. Which God has what? Before ordained. That word ordered, ordained. That we what? Should walk in them. And by the way, those good works, they start now. The work of faith, labor of love, faith and hope. And they continue on throughout all eternity. Let's go to the book of Titus. Go to Titus chapter 1. But there are evil workers in the scriptures. On the way there, stop at Philippians chapter number 3. Because there are many people working in the body of Christ, but not all of them are working, are the sanctified works of the grace believer. Watch this. In Philippians chapter number, what I think, 3. Verse 2, Paul says, start at verse 1, finally my brethren, rejoice in the who? Now, now see, man, look at this. Sorry about this. Because look at here. Train your mind, I'm going to show you what Paul means when he talks about the Lord. He says it in 2 Timothy 4, the righteous, anybody remember? All right, we're going to have a quiz on that. The righteous judge. He's thinking of the judgment seed of Christ. How can you rejoice in the Lord? Because if you're listening to Paul, you can rejoice. If you're not listening to Paul, you can't rejoice. Because that righteous judge will be your terror. 2 Corinthians 5, therefore knowing the terror of the Lord, the righteous judge, right? So he's either going to be something you... Rejoice in Pauline Grace Believer, who's who's operating in it, by the way. It's not just knowing Paul. Let me let me get this out there. If you've harmed another brother, especially a grace believer, be very aware. I talked about that one guy who he, he harmed way back. And he knew, and he knew. He says, Brother Ron, I don't want this to go unresolved for positive, you know, positively. Because that man knew, and this has been years since he's trying to reconcile that time. Be, be aware. Because little things like that into us are huge. In Paul, in his last epistle, he says, no man stood with me. They, they were ashamed of Paul, so they didn't stand with him at his little mock trials of the Roman Empire. You know what he says? I pray the Lord led not to their charge. That's like charge at the, in, a, in a courtroom. Yes, it is. Like the Lord's going to say, hey, all that stuff is in vain because be not ashamed of testimony of me nor my prisoner, Paul. 
So let me tell you something. So make sure you clear this up because then you can rejoice. Be above board on that. Because either you're going to rejoice or he's going to be your terror. Because the word of the Lord is the righteous judge. Here, notice in verse 1. Finally, my brethren, rejoice where? In the Lord. You can do that if you have that clear conscience before Almighty God. In, in the truth. To write the same things to you. Oh, man. He says here, that, in that, 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 that Old Testament comment, you going out there, you are you about to worship God, you about to go take your offering, your your offering to the temple, and you got off with your brother, he says, you, you, you drop that offer right there, and you go back and you get reconciled first. Don't come to me. This stuff is serious. Don't let the sun go down on your ass. He's going to say that next <laughs> That's coming up in, 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 in Ephesians, yeah. That's why I say, as I'm reading it over and over, Paul, he's, he's on this. Watch this. Watch what he says here in verse 1. Finally, my brother, rejoice in the, the Lord. To write the same things... To, to write the same things to you, to me indeed is not grief. It doesn't grieve me, but for you it is what? Same. The fact that the Apostle Paul keeps having to remind him, he says, it doesn't grieve me to constantly tell you this, because he knew how important it was at the judgment seat. He says, for you it is safe. <laughs> I play baseball. You run it around the bases. You try to steal second or more sport, you come around with the winning run. And you slide, you catch and get the ball, and you do that. All you're looking for is that umpire right there to say, say, <laughs> you know. Next thing, if his arm go up like this, you out, you just, oh. That's what he's saying. When you get to that judgment seat, you want to say, safe, safe at home, safe at home. Paul says, it's safe. Beware of dogs. Beware of those lost heathen Gentiles around you, Philippians, who try to get you to go into their idol worshiping. Beware of what type of workers? The e- well, first he says the evil workers. Okay. I'll tell you who those are in a minute. Okay. Beware of the concision. The concision has to do with those Jews, those lost Jews, or Christ directing Jews. You know who the evil workers are? Those are other members of the body of Christ who reject the Apostle Paul and teach contrary doctrines. They're working. That's why I said, Dorothy, if someone is teaching on TV or radio, and even if they mention Paul here and there, but if they don't rightly divide, they don't make that distinction. See, you can you can filter that out. We can filter it out. Separate the meat from the bones. But the average believer in the body cannot filter. If old Jack Van Empey says it, that's the way it is. You can say, well, Jack is talking about that, but that's for Israel over here. You can kind of put those things. Everybody can't do that, so you got to be aware. That's why you got to preach the rightly divided word. Now go with me to uh, Titus as we come down to the end. This issue of creating Christ Jesus unto good works. If you want to know what they are, the book of Titus, all of Paul's epistles, but the book of Titus gives you, it, it, it actually, the theme and focus of the entire book is good works. Let me tell you some things about Titus. The book of Titus is all about good works. Paul uses the term good work six times in the book of Titus. Six is the number of man. It's man doing good works before God. If you look down at chapter number one, remember we talk a lot about how you deny Christ. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12, if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. Same verse. If we deny him, he will also what? Deny us. Now, it's not salvation, because the next verse says, we believe not yet, he abides faith, cannot deny himself. He's, we're saved by grace. But what, what, what God has done, though, is after you're saved, he then wants to see the good works that he's ordained. And here they are, right here. Let me, let me uh, show you with our few minutes. If I was to narrow down the good works we're ordained to today, number one, the work of faith. And this is from Paul in 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 3 and 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 3. The work of faith, that's building the doctrine into you, getting the word into you, into yourself. That's what you're doing now. You guys, and then they're following. Then there's the labor of love or charity or the love of God, how he operates. That's taking the word in you, and then and the ministry and so forth, getting it out to others. So ministry, ministry to others. By the way, 
If with your time, talent, treasures you're part of this ministry, that, that's what you're doing. And then, because the policy of evil is going to want to get you to faint in this truth, there's the patience of hope. Patience of hope, which is also the hope of glory. You just endure, don't faint, don't, don't fall away, because there's glory to be good. And that's basically, that's your life right there. Those are the good works. Now he goes into different details, everybody's different, but notice in verse number, chapter 1, verse 16. Titus 1, 16. When he says, they, if we deny him, here's how you deny him, verse number 16. They profess that they know God, so they're professing Christians. But in what? Works, they deny him. And their works, they're evil workers. Being, here's what their works are in front of God. Being abominable, and it's an abomination. And what? Are they obedient or disobedient? They're disobedient. Who don't they listen to? Through Paul. Oh, they profess they know God. But they don't listen to the Apostle Paul. Okay? Disobedient and to every good work. Did God ordain that we walk in these good works? Yes. But to every good work, they're what? Reprobate. Reprobate. You know that word reprobate? Reprobate. It's the opposite. Guess what the opposite of the word is? Approved. Literally, the word reprobate, the, the Greek word behind these two words are like the anti. They're the same Greek word, but opposite. One means unapproved. Now, I wonder where the issue of unapproved comes up before God. Oh, yeah. Study. This one book. Oh, study to show thyself approved unto God. How, how do you know where God... It's a difference. Every knee shall bow to God, it says about the Lord's judgment seat. Romans 14. Okay. Study to show thyself approved unto who? God. A workman, workmanship, creating a, a workman who needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, right, dividing the word of truth. You're going to be approved. The opposite of proof is reprobate. So when they get to the judgment seat of Christ, all of their works are considered what? Reprobate, unapproved, then that means they denied him, and if they deny him, he will also do what? Deny them what? Reigning. <clears throat> Reigning with him. Second Timothy. See, it's, it's not that difficult. See? Now, as we come down to the end, let me show you what the number one good work is, Titus. Paul tells Titus. Verse, verse 1. But speak, chapter 2, verse 1. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. By the way, he starts verse 2 off by saying, but if these guys are having repro reprobate works, Paul tells Titus the opposite, but speak thou the things which become what? Sound doctrine. Then he goes through how the, how the uh, church should operate. Look down in verse uh, 7. In all things showing thyself a pattern of what? Good works. Good works. What's the first thing he mentions? In what? Doctrine showing up cor uncorruptness. Gravity says there. Did you know the number one good work is not going out into the mission fields? It's not going door to door sharing the gospel? It's getting Paul's doctrine in yourself and in others. Get by one another. Yes. First yourself and then others. Yep. Let's, let's, let's end here in uh, Titus. Go down to verse number uh, 14 of chapter 2. Speaking of Jesus who gave himself for us, that's the Calvary, that, here's the purpose, he might redeem us from all iniquity, there's our sanctification, and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of what? Good works. By the way, as a minister, I'm to speak these things and exhort and rebuke with all uh, authority. Let no minister. By the way, we're to be zealous of good works. Are you zealous for the good works of God's grace? Are you zealous to do the work of faith, the labor of love, the patience of hope? I hope you are. I am going to be, and I'm going to make it so that we, um, we'll be fervent in spirit together, right? Zealous. Let's get into chapter 3. Look at chapter 3. Verse number 8. This is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm just a little bit. So if I'm always talking about this, Blame the Apostle Paul, then blame God, and then you get blamed up there. No, you see it, you read it, verse 8. Affirm constantly. Affirm means to...
keep giving to them, make it firm in their understanding, that they which have believed in God might be careful, take care, to do what? Maintain good works. These things are good and what? Profitable unto men. Huh. Where you, where you think? You get a little down here, but you know what he's looking forward to? The judgment seat. One more. In the book, verse, verse 14. And let ours also, what? Learn. So you must instruct them to maintain, what? Good works for necessary uses. So that's here. But look at the rest of that verse. We got it in. That they be not unfruitful. Where will that fruit is fruit that abounds to your account where? At the judgment seat of Christ. You see what the apostle, his whole ministry is talking about this. We get accused, because we talk about the judgment seat and stuff, the joint air and denying and reign, of being legalists. That's weird. Because when you read all Paul's epistles, especially the book of Titus, we're constantly, we're not talking about good works to be saved. No. To be justified, salvation. This is a reward issue, isn't it? Yeah. You're saved by God's grace through faith plus no works. But after you get saved, move on to what Paul says, unto good works. Maintain them. Affirm constantly. And I'm going to do that. That's because that's what the apostle says. And you guys want me to do what he says, right? Amen. 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 All right. They want to do it too. That's right. Well... If you're listening today and you never had anyone love you enough to ask you if you were to God, baby, Jim, that, that flyer you put together is fantastic. If you want to know for sure that you're going to go to heaven, well, you can know God commended his love toward us. And that while we, we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. If you trust the shed blood of Christ on Calvary's cross, God will save you this moment. And when you get saved, you've done nothing but believe God. His letter said, you've heard the word of truth. You believed it. you got to act on it. You act on it by faith. You say, I believe. You say in your heart, Lord, I believe Christ died for me. Now, after you're saved, give your life over to the good works of grace. We'll help you with that. That's the work of faith, listening, the labor of love, being a part of his ministry, your time, talent, church, to get it out to others, and then suffer with us, suffer with the Lord in these last terrible, grievous days. But you know what you get? You got glory. You're reigning with Christ. Don't deny him through evil works. Suffer with him through the good works of grace. The opposite of denying him through evil works is to suffer with him in the good works of the sanctified grace believer. We'll help you with that. Okay? All right. Let's end like this. Sorry for those who are listening. It's for the singing voice. Christ is all that he claims to be. And I'm so glad that he lives in me. My hope of glory, yes, he is. That's fantastic. For he is mine. And I am His. Heavenly Father, we do thank You for the Lord Jesus Christ and that hope of glory in Him. It's Christ in us, Gentiles, the hope of glory. Our only hope of sharing in His glory is to obey Him through the Apostle Paul. Thank You for the truth laid out in Scripture. As we have our time of Q&A and, and, and fellowship and sharing, we give You thanks and praise in Christ's name. Amen.